The Monty and the Pharaoh Show is brought to you by... Because wine is your second favorite four-letter word. California wine, New York attitude, good fucking wine. Yeah. I'd like to welcome you to No Holds Barred. This is a show dedicated to speaking to the people who have the boots on the ground. Not the media, not the politicians, but the actual guys carrying out the orders of the government, having to think on their feet, put their lives on the line, who really know firsthand what's going on. Not what we're being told, but seeing it with their own eyes and being there. And today we're going to talk about a topic that's very hot on the news right now, which is the border. It concerns a lot of us, a lot of Americans, what's going on, what we're facing. And so I'd like to introduce retired U.S. Border Patrol Deputy Patrol Agent in Charge, Clayton Clay Thomas. Today we'll be discussing a myriad of issues ranging from the immigration influx, the migrant protection protocols for state in Mexico, Title 42, going away in May. And Operation Allies welcome the evacuation and resettlement of Afghans to the United States, where he served as the DHS Deputy Federal Coordinator. We spoke a little about this last episode. I apologize for the technical difficulties regarding what we're doing here. We had to deal with a lot of uh, issues, and we're working our way through them. But I, but I think you'll find that episode very, very enlightening. And we're going to touch on some of those topics we spoke of, but this time I really want you, Clay, to kind of maybe give a more human side to this. And I'd like to start with what we discussed in our last episode, which was the immigration influx, past and present. Uh, can you give us some insight of what you saw, what you've been dealing with, and what's really going on? Sure. Hey, Frank. Thanks for having me back. Uh, the, the past and present, as we spoke about last time, in 2019, the numbers were incredible. Uh, they were numbers we had never seen in the Border Patrol, at least in the recent, recent history. So for comparison of numbers, uh, the station I was at, we were apprehending roughly 1,000 a day, 7,500 a week for six or eight weeks straight. If you remember, the Border Patrol is built to apprehend and process and return single adult Mexican males. When it comes to 7,500 people a week, for that amount of time, our capacity is roughly between the two facilities at the station about 300 people. You do the math, it doesn't equal up even for half a shift. So, and then if you consider the, the demographics that we were catching were family units, whether that's a mother and child, father and child, mom, dad and child, unaccompanied children. Unaccompanied children pose even a, a greater concern to us because of the requirements to protect them while they're in our custody. We protect everybody in custody, but especially the children. And so the more you separate these demographics, the less space you have. So when you compare 2019, we were building tents, 20 by 60 military uh, quasi, quasi tents. We're putting down fiberglass landing mat that we used for helicopter landing pads as the flooring. We had some sleeping bags that were donated to us by FEMA. So we're giving people sleeping bags on landing mats inside of a tent. We had swamp cooler. Obviously, it's very dry and hot here in the desert. We, the swamp coolers only work so much. They come from temperate climates, humid, tropical climates. So the swamp coolers were either too cold. It would get too hot. Uh, we had refrigerated air. That wasn't right. 
And so because we were unable to remove anyone, minus the family, if we were releasing up to a thousand family units a day at one time, that is a lot of people. And, and, but and one thing, and we'll stop you. What we want to this. These are people who don't have really a place to go. Am I correct? No support system in place. No income. Right, so that we're not dealing with just people from Mexico. In fact, the majority of the people we were dealing with at the time in 19, uh, and it hasn't, t I'll touch on today's uh, demographics as well, but in 19, Central Americans, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Venezuela, Cuba, Brazil, Haiti, Turkey, you name it. Nobody from, well, I mean, we're dealing with Mexico, but the Mexicans, we have a removal system in place. We didn't have that for these other folks, aside from the family units. And like I said, we're releasing over a thousand a day. But then when you get into single adults, if you start releasing single adults, you have no immigration. You have no immigration policy. It's basically an open border. So we're holding on to these single adults, males and females. And when you talk about holding people for that long, there's an, a, the agency ICE. They have HSI, which is the investigations. They have it's Homeland Security Investigations. You have ERO, which is Enforcement and Removals. They run the immigration camps. They do all the removals and uh, of, of folks and they handle the immigration courts. They only have a certain capacity across the entire country. And when you're catching that volume of people, they fill up within a day or two. And so we're holding people for months. We're holding some single adult males, which is where these facilities have space for for 45 to 50 days. Single adult females with a very limited population in these detention centers for single adult females. We are holding single adult females over 60 days. And we're talking intense on fiberglass with sleeping bags. We were catering in food. We had contracts going with these catering companies where we would have to we'd get a large group and we'd have to call them and say, I just need 500 of whatever you can bring me, whether it's a hot dog or a chicken sandwich or something. We had snacks, we had waters, we had all kinds of things. When you hold people that long, showers are a problem. Um, we had full medical, we had four full facilities, uh, full, full medical facilities set up outside, inside, in all the different locations to treat all the demographics. So a huge logis logistical challenge for us. And you see anxiety, you see uh, cultural considerations for food. Uh, we were spending roughly every week we'd go and spend a couple thousand dollars at barnes and noble just to buy books how to learn how to speak english uh whatever they wanted um we found that there's gastrointestinal problems when you have people in custody that long eating the same thing so we had to buy fruit you know we had to develop all these things on the go because we're not built to hold them so 19 terrible problem the administration at the time, the prior administration, they put in what we call minor protection protocols or stay in Mexico. We call it MPP. It's just an acronym. The government's full of three or four other acronyms. And what we were able to do is with a lot of demographics, we work with Mexico, which is deemed a safe third country. And we were allowed to put these people back in Mexico to await their court hearing in the United States. For example, if you want to apply for asylum or you have a credible fear of your country, of returning to your country, you go to the port of entry, you present yourself to our brothers and sisters of blue, the CBP officers, Customs and Border Protection. You apply, they handle your case there, and then you work through the system that way. If you enter between the ports of entry, which is where the green guys are, the Border Patrol guys, you are breaking a federal law under Title Eight. You're entering the country illegally. You are no longer allowed to apply for asylum. So this migrant protection protocols, or stay in Mexico, allowed us to return you to Mexico, you present yourself at the port of entry, they give you a court date, and you start going through the system. They would parole you in to go to the courts. This was great, and it allowed us to lower our population in custody, lower that time in custody that we had with these people that were just sitting with us. And then we were basically maintaining in a humanitarian way. We were not built for that. We were an enforcement entity. So... Migrant protection protocols kicked off, and of course it was a slow roll, a slow start to with Mexico to only certain demographics, certain numbers a day. You know, it started out at 10 or 25, then to 100, and then they allowed us to add Cubans in small numbers, and then finally they opened up and it was a lot of people. And we were able to drop our numbers in custody. We were releasing all the family units, unaccompanied children. We would go through the officer resettlement and, ref and 
if we, uh, the ORRs we call them, or um, they, they would place the children inside the country if they had family members, or they would place them with foster homes. So the children were being taken care of, the unaccompanied children, the, the family units were getting released, and then these single adults were either finding space within these detention centers or were returning them to Mexico, non-punitive, in the minor protection protocols to present to claim asylum. Then enter COVID. COVID shut everything down. As you're aware, the whole country shut down for a long time. The courts shut down. There's a lot of services within the government that shut down. So when that shut down, uh, President Trump enacted Title 42. Title 42, basically, we talked about the last program, allows us to expel people immediately to the country they came from, uh, where they're coming from a country that had a pandemic virus or a contagious virus that could contaminate the United States to stop them from furthering into the United States to harm our people. So Title 42 came into play, and basically that was a quick process. People across the border, we would apprehend them. We didn't allow them in the side of the facilities. We had processing facilities set up outside. We would do a 10, 10 print fingerprint roll. We would do iris scanning and, and facial recognition. As long as they weren't a hardened criminal or anything that we needed to prosecute, we'd walk them right up back to to the top of the bridge and they go back into Mexico. Now I'm punitive again, but it was a way to keep people out of the country. So our populations in custody stayed very low. And so you compare that to now, this new administration, they want to get rid of Title 42. They say May 23rd, Title 42 is going away. Now we're going to be back to the same process so where we don't have a method to remove people from custody. If you listen to the White House press secretary, they say they have mitigation efforts that are planned. I talked to a lot of the guys that I used to work with. They're still working. I asked what these mitigation efforts are. I'm curious because we didn't have them before, so I don't know how we're going to have them now. And the answer is it's going to be this whole of government approach. Well, I can tell you, I'll translate that. That means we're going to rely on ERO, Enforcement Removal Operations, who have the detention centers to house people and then remove them. That's not going to happen. We already showed that in 19. Furthermore, ERO, Enforcement Removals, under ICE, they're taking I people stop. in. I've got to stop. Yes. i got to stop you for a second. Okay, I want people to really take this. 42 is actually the most humane way to deal with this overflow. It gives people really their freedom and gives them a real opportunity to come to the United States legally. And this administration, you're telling me, has no intention of doing that. They want to eliminate that knowing fully well that these people are going to be back in custody for an indefinite amount of time in these horrible living conditions. And that's, and they're pitching that as being humane. And I don't understand how that's humane unless, of course, they see them going over the border is being inhumane because there's no services there for those people. So I have to ask that question, what, what's waiting on the other side when you release them and they go to Mexico? Is there anything set up for them there? Or do they just get lost in the process? So I ran international operations uh, for our sector for a couple of years. We dealt a lot with the federal government in Mexico and the military and also the non-government organizations in Mexico. And since 19, pretty much throughout, these non-government organizations, these churches, the Catholic diocese, and these other organizations that will house and help people have been overflowed. Uh, they're, they're, they're overfilled. They, they overflow daily. They, they pack people in. That's another uh, center that communicates disease. Uh, you're putting people in inhumane conditions in Mexico. And so by returning them, you're allowing them to go through the ports of entry. Well, the ports of entry only have so much capacity as well. They're, they're the processing of people. Legitimate trade and travel is their mission to get people and commodity into the country. They can't handle thousands to process through these, these different programs. So you return them to Mexico and let them do things the right way. There is nothing really for them to stay a long time in Mexico. We can't house them because in the Border Patrol, we are an enforcement agency. Sooner or later, you get away from enforcement and you go into humanitarian care. There is no longer enforcement because you have all of your assets taking care of people, kids, families, processing. That's all our agents are doing. I used the example last time. 
largest group ever had ever apprehended in Border Patrol history, 1,038, was apprehended by our station. We had two agents on the line and two National Guard units with night vision trucks. That's when we were in a true humanitarian crisis, taking care of people with no enforcement. The difference is, like I said last time, last time we didn't know what we didn't know. We didn't know what we were missing. We didn't know how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were coming through. We didn't know it was terrorists. We didn't know it was murderers. We didn't know it was rapists. Now we have a better count. We're doing better counting, so we know numbers. You'll hear that reported through the media that we're missing 300,000 people as gotaways is what we call them. We just don't know what they are still. You don't know if it's a terrorist. You don't know if it's a rapist. You don't know if it's a murderer. You have no idea what you're missing. And so we're in bad shape. Again, yeah, when Title 42 goes away, we're gonna, the yeah, numbers are going to increase even more. Here, because you, you brought up a very good point. You don't know who's coming into the country. So that effectively, the government, whoever is the administration, has basically uh, betrayed the whole purpose of the border control. They, they've sold out your mission. All right, so my, my question is, is this a real threat? I mean, we're hearing it from factions within our own country that are basically fanatical in, in their own beliefs. Um, I don't necessarily agree with them. I, I, I'm an immigrant myself, like, like, but we did it illegally with my family. We came in from Canada. My parents were refugees from the Holocaust. But it makes you wonder, what's, what, I mean, is, is everybody asleep at the wheel? I mean, what's, what's happening here? Who's to say that, as I was saying before, that we don't have these sleeper cells entering the country that makes uh, destruction of World Trade Centers, uh, you know, a milk run. And we're only talking a handful of terrorists when that happened. You know, you can put in a, a brigade for is what you based on when you only catch when you catch a thousand people a day. And let's say there's like ten a day, and you do that, you do the math. You know, thirty days. That's three hundred able-bodied terrorists, if you want to call it that. So, so Frank, you got to put this in perspective. We are empowering the cartels. The cartels run all of this. It is a business model on their end, and there's calculated loss and gain on the cartel's end. We've seen it more often than not. They will send through a group of unaccompanied children. Um, personal story. I was doing a tour on the line for some headquarters folks, and right in front of us, a smuggler pushed across seven unaccompanied children. One seven-year-old was carrying a car seat with an eight-month-old eight -month baby in the car seat. The eight-month-old was not related to anyone in the group, and a seven-year-old was carrying that baby. The baby and all the kids had their information written on the inside of their coats on a, on a piece of paper. So when you talk about a possible terrorist, a possible high-value person entering the country, it's absolutely possible. They throw distractions. They throw family units. They throw children. Things that they know that we're going to have to take care of. We can't break off to catch that group that we're missing. So we don't know what we don't know. And this is, it's that loss and gain, that business model that they run. The commodity of humans is more valuable than narcotics many times right now. I was in Mexico dealing with quite frankly with some heavy heavy hitters there both on the cartel end talking to them because I have relations there as well as in the government and law enforcement and they both were stressing the fact that it looks like human slavery bondage uh, trafficking of human beings is going to be the new big industry for them it's the return of slavery, what we saw for centuries around the world. It's it's happening now and here in America. It's 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 to me that's it's just unconscionable and I think it's probably one of the most important issues that we as human beings need to address. And this is human suffering. This is this is um, a no compromise kind of situation.
Do you treat your dog as part of the family? <laughs> well, so do we. So why not celebrate your pup's birthday with the ultimate party box? Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Party Pup Info, and let us make your pup's party or any celebration perfection. And Nitro's Garage, for all your automotive needs, call 646-675-2349. That's 646-675-2349. For all your automotive needs, Nitro's Garage, ask for Jack. And APB, American Protection Bureau, voted number one best on Long Island for all your security needs. Call 631-390-9050. That's 631-390-9050. APB. Hello, everyone. If you're joining us a little late, uh, this is No Holds Barred with Frank Dukes, where we give the guy Guys, um, the boots on the ground, an opportunity to speak and see, tell us what they see and what's really going on and what they know to be the truth, not the politicians, not the media, the actual people doing it. I'd like to reintroduce in our guest tonight, for those of you who may have missed it, it's retired U.S. Border Patrol Deputy Patrol Agent in Charge, Clayton Clay Thomas. Today we'll be discussing a myriad of issues ranging from the migration influx to migrant protection protocols for stay in Mexico, Title 42 going away in May, and operations allies welcome the evacuation and resettlement of Afghans to the United States, where he served as DHAS Deputy Federal Coordinator. Now, before we left, Clay, what you said was very emotional, it touched me deeply regarding that imagery that hit me of just seven children and a, and, a, and a child in a car seat, eight months old, and, and they're coming to the United States with no no one, no adult looking out for them. And then they're coming with these horrible conditions uh, because no one's set up for it, and it's sort of like everybody's turning a blind eye to this. My next question to you would be, how would you fix this situation? Because obviously they're saturated on the other side of the border trying to take care of them. Uh, I, my personal belief is got to start with penalties and prosecuting the people who are bringing them here and driving them up here from Guatemala and El Salvador and making this possible because I can't see how thousands of people are making this passage without any kind of assistance. As people who are assisting them or encouraging them to come, I think are the ones that really need to be prosecuted and, and process here for undermining our, our country, being a, a clear and present danger to this to the safety of our, our nation. Um, that's just logical in my mind. Do you agree with my thoughts, or do you have other ideas, Clay, regarding this whole subject matter? No, I absolutely agree with you 100%. Uh, there's two parts to it, though. There are ongoing efforts here in the United States. Homeland Security Investigations does a great job investigating the nodes and the networks on this end, the facilitators, the, the people that are, are facilitating the smuggling into the United States on the United States side. They also have efforts going on in other countries. There have been some big operations that have gone on, but these smuggling methods are so entrenched through, and there's a lot of protection along the way. You can't say that people, thousands of people are just traveling through Mexico without any protection. So. There are visas issued. Mexico upped it to, I believe, 30 days now. So it's a, a visitor visa because they know they're just transiting Mexico. So we've really, in the United States, we go after, we see what we call the recycling of kids. Where we'll see the same child apprehended with different families several different times. Um, prosecuting those families, trying to dig into the roots of these organizations who maybe get a child with a family through and they deliver them all the way up to, say, New Jersey. And then the child gets returned to Brazil and then it brings up another, with another family. So we're trying to dig into that. Homeland Security Investigations does a great job. But in the other countries, when you go to Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, you go to Mexico, to Brazil, you go to Cuba, you go to wherever, it is so hard to have the resources to attack these smuggling organizations and then to combat all the protection that's afforded all the way along to the border. So I completely agree with you, but it's a problem set that I believe is we're outnumbered on it. And I, I don't have the answer on, on how to get 
these agencies enough resources to work with these other governments to combat that? I, I think it's a discussion that really needs to be put before the Congress. I, I think a task force should be put in place, a congressional committee put in place doing this. And I think that's where we need to head to. And, and I'm hoping this show might encourage someone to, to, to in government, to you know, be inspired by what you're saying here, what we're talking about, and do something about it. Because everybody's skirting the issue. It doesn't look like anybody really wants to address the issue. They want to, it's like a game of hot potato. You know, the president had it, and he, he threw the hot potato into uh, the vice's hands, and the vice president is now throwing it into somebody else's hands. And it just keeps going on and on and on, and the problem isn't being addressed. And I don't think it will be addressed until something catastrophic happens in this country. The saddest thing, in my mind, is what, is these children. I mean, what's going to happen to them? I mean, I'm thinking just the formulation of their minds of, of, of being treated like this and growing up this way. How is that going to affect them as adults later in life? Are they going to be exploiters of children themselves because they were exploited? I mean, that's what the, the research tells us, the data tells us, people who are abused become the abusers. So, I think this is one of the greatest social problems of this century, and it has to be addressed, because it affects all of us. You know, I'm a strong believer that we are our brother's keeper. We have to step forward and do something here. I mean, that's real humanity. That's where we really need to be. Um, it's certainly an issue I would I'll bring up to the World Organization for Peace and see what we can do about it on, on, an, on a, another level. Those of you who don't know, I'm a U.S. representative of the World Organization of Peace. The organization was the one that actually bridged the gap between North and South Korea, got the actual presidents to meet. And that, everyone thought that was impossible. And they're actually helping reunite families and reconnect, which is an amazing thing to do because people don't realize is the war with North Korea, they just have a, we just have a ceasefire going on between South and North Korea. That's, that's all that's going on there. A war is, in actuality, Korean War is actually still alive, uh, which is amazing to me when President Trump actually walked across the line there. I mean, that took some some stories as far as I'm concerned. Um, he didn't hide back there with goggles and look across the line like I've seen every politician before. But love him or hate him, you've got to respect that gesture of, of leadership. Um and I'm not proposing Trump's this great guy or, or whatever. I mean, he's got his issues, too. I'm just saying that gesture of doing the, un, the unusual, I think, is what's needed here. We need someone with that kind of leadership and willingness to lead from the front um, in this matter. Uh take charge. I mean, do you agree with that, Clay? Do you think that's where it really needs to start? Or is there another place we need to go to eradicate this issue? No, I can I completely agree with you. And I, I, as you're talking, I'm reflecting upon some of the extreme frustrations on my end and it's shared through all the agents as well. Um, in 19, um, we were inundated. Uh, my, my counterpart and I with Congressional visits, delegation visits, sometimes three in a day. That's all we did. And it was everybody that you see on TV that has power to change. Um, when you talk about the squad, we had all of them. You talk about anybody. In, in 19, it was mainly the Democrats that came to visit us, very few Republicans. Um, Democrats came to criticize um, it was extremely contentious every time we dealt. Um, it, you know, I know last time we touched on it with uh, being in the cell with AOC and she's accusing us of having people drinking out of toilets when it was completely a false narrative. Um, talking about Nadler coming down and, and really being contentious about the way we do things and the way we prosecute, the way we remove hit wrong information. And so that same group that was highly critical in 19 now, if they visit, and they don't, the, the volume is not the same, but nothing has changed. When you talk about kids in cages from Obama through Trump, 
Now under Biden, nothing has changed. The facilities, some facilities have been updated to the centralized processing centers. We have little kind of romp rooms for the kids, which is great. It's much nicer. But nonetheless, nothing has changed. So the same group of politicians that came down that was highly critical, accusatory of everything under the sun, when the humanitarian effort and the empathy spread by the Border Patrol is, is immense. Now they're silent. And nothing has changed. So it's all photo opportunities. You talk about... Um, President Biden passing the torch to Vice President Harris as our borders are. Well, I briefed her. I was part of the executive briefing team when she paid her so-called visit to the border. We all know that she showed up soon to beat Trump because Trump said he was coming down later in the week. When she came down, she didn't go to the line. She did not go to the border. She went to a centralized processing center, completely controlled environment. It was closed to the media. I mean, there was national media there to report on it, but there was no photography taken for us. And so everything was brief, everything was staged through. Uh, she had a, a meeting with some unaccompanied children at the end of the uh, tour, where she, she spoke with them, we were around in there, and she left. She spoke briefly with the Office of Field Operations, but never actually toured the border. And when she goes to other countries, and say, she says, don't come. I wish it was that easy. We want them to come the right way. Telling them not to come when the U.S. is the magnet. We have no consequence. You talked about punishment. You talked about a consequence, consequence delivery system, which is what I've been talking about. We have no method of removing people. There are some flights, maybe a flight or two going to certain countries. But when you talk about a flight or two, you're talking about a couple of hundred people. So there's no way that any consequence delivery system is going to accommodate what's going on. You're going to hear in the media that migrant protection protocol, stay in Mexico, is still in place. True. But we are removing so few people into Mexico for that program now, it is really insignificant. So all these politicians are out for photo ops. They're out to either oppose the prior president or in favor of the current president or whatever the political view might be. It goes back and forth. But there is nothing being done about it. So the problem is not going to fix itself. It's just going to, it's just going to multiply and get worse. Clay, I really want to thank you for what you, you're sharing here. I mean, that's pretty courageous you come out and say these things right now because of the political backlash and vindictiveness that can happen uh, to former employees of the federal government and certain truths to light. I think it's a, a question I have for you. We heard nothing about the cages. We heard in 2019, the children in cages, children in cages, children in cages, and like you said, EOC talking about them drinking out of the toilets and all this, which is not true. So my question is, are these still in cages, or, and why aren't we hearing about it anymore? So great question. I mean, this, this is the third administration that we've had so-called cages. We don't have cages. We have I told you earlier in the program, told you last program, we're not built to hold people. We're not detention. We're not built to do those things, especially with children, with family units, which includes children. We're built for some more adult Mexican males. So when it first started as a topic about kids in cages back under Obama, it's because we had chain link fencing up, because we had to divide. I talked earlier about capacity issues. When you talk about separating demographics, you put single adult Mexican, or single adult males in one spot, single adult females in another spot. You can't put them in with family units. And then you can't put a mom with a 17-year-old son in with a mom with a 6-year-old daughter. You can't put a dad in with a daughter with a mom. You, know, you, you have to separate. And the more you separate, the less space we have. So these cages, so to speak, are just the visual places so that we can hold more people in this process. And in Trump, Nothing changed. If anything, it improved. We improved our facilities. We had tents. We had temporary holding facilities, which are large, 500 capacity tents with wraparound services. Now, we've improved even further. Um, about a year and a half ago, like in El Paso, the Centralized Processing Center, what we call it a CPC. This is a processing center. It has a capacity of about 1,200 people. It has different holding areas for different demographics, but the more you split them up, that 1,200 goes down pretty quickly. So now we don't have kids divided up into these chain link type areas anymore. 
now in these centralized processing centers, we have large rooms that have, just like you've seen at daycare, they have the rubber mats, they have the toys, they have the TVs, we have Disney movies going, uh, I mean, we, we laugh. We, our favorite was um, uh, Toy Story, you know? Instead of hearing to the Canadian here, 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 here um, in Quinito de Masaya, you know, you hear it in Spanish, and we all laugh about it, but it's true. We've improved with funding and other things and building these facilities. But in the end, not a darn thing has changed. We've just gotten better at how to all of a sudden hold people and detain them while these other organizations take them out of our custody and do what they need to do with them. So nothing has changed. Full opportunities are still there. The facilities are just getting better over time. But if you consider from the end of Obama, the second term of Obama, through the term of Trump, and now he's halfway through this administration with Joe Biden, we have to get better. So that's just the natural progression. So, Clayton, since the facilities have improved, uh, what's going on with the agents? So that's really the tough spot. Um, building a station of you know, nearly 350 agents, which is a, it's a large station, but not nearly the biggest in the country. But like I said, they're enforcement. And when we transition from that enforcement into that humanitarian care, now agents are processing, agents are escorting for showers, agents are escorting for phone calls, agents are basically doing the job of a civilian, and they're no longer no no enforcement. And so that takes a toll on morale. Agents, of course, administrative pieces are part of the job, but they want to be out on the line. They want to be out in the sun. They want to be out in the middle of the night where things go blue. They want to be getting dirty. And so agents' jobs have changed completely. The board tools do a great job. They've created a new position called Board for Processing Coordinator. It's getting kicked off. These are, we go through an academy, they you know, black and tan uniforms. They do our processing. So they, they're taking over some of those roles so we can start returning some of those guys to the line. But you gotta remember, Border Patrol agent is hired to enforce the federal laws of the United States. And they're not doing that when they're inside. And for lack of a better way of saying, they're babysitting people. And so, yes, the facilities have improved incredibly. Are they adequate for what we can hold? Yes. When we get overflowed, absolutely not. When we start putting up tents, no. So, the jobs and the morale and, and the responsibility of our agents when we see agents having to change diapers, more more bottles, more amount of food, uh, and it's just, it's not a good scenario com compared to what they're hired to do, what the, what the mission says is to do. So what this is kind of looking like to me is this is a game of misdirection. You probably have the cartels funding this mass migration of, of people, sending them to the border, tying up the border patrol to make it easier for them to smuggle you know, drugs across the border, people, certain people across the border. Um, and are we really looking at an invasion here? You know? That's kind of, um, I think, an oversimplified explanation of what's going on. I think, in my personal opinion, I think it's really smart uh, strategy on the part of the cartels. We know that they will send a certain amount of dope across the border to get caught. And while people are processing that, they know that they, the line is weakened so they can send the real big ship in the cross. That's the kind of uh, cunning that these people have got. They're not dumb. And I remember when I was in Mexico, I looked at it truck and I was near the border and I'm going, what's that? I start to a cartel member and he's he was laughing. He says, well that's how we get across. I said, what do you mean? It's a bridge. He says it's on the back of a truck, it goes over your fence and we just drive over and then it retracts and we leave. And that was one of their ways of getting across. So it seems to me that um, uh, it's not quite that sure that's happening. And maybe that's why you're seeing all these people coming. But uh, I have to ask you, you know, with the morale going down, why isn't more being done to put another branch in just to handle the housing of these people? So, 
that is going on. And, and to your point, first of all, in Mexico, we talked earlier about the cartels having a business model. They're extremely smart, extremely um, efficient with the way we do things, and it's money. It's all based on money. And so, yeah, if they can occupy our time, and, and their vision on the border is, is far more advanced than anybody gives them credit for. They know exactly where our guys are. They know tendencies. They know numbers. And so if they know if they can occupy a certain part of the border and they want to get a shipment of fentanyl across, or they want to get a high-profile um, high group across, they know how to do this. I mean, it, it's not any big secret. And so to create a group to house these folks, that's already happening. Um, they have hotels working out here to for enforcement removal operations under ICE, ELO, to house these folks for X amount of time until they get them released, or when they're in a sick ward, or they hold them until they're not contagious anymore, or they have another ward, or they have what they call ISAP, and I don't know what the acronym is, but it's alternative detention or ATD, where they do the ankle bracelet monitors or the cell phone with the facial recognition that they report in on. Um, when they're on an order of release. So it's happening, but we don't have the facilities and the infrastructure to house thousands of people. We talked about it last time. We talked about Operation Allies Welcome. And we're reselling the Afghans through these non government organizations, through the International Organization of Migration and the Marshall Refugee Committee. And they coordinate with these different groups in the United States. You know, certain places like Sacramento, California, like Austin, Houston, Texas, like um, up in Northern Virginia. They just completely shut down and said we can't take any more because we don't have any more housing. We don't have any more facilities to offer these folks. So if that's happening, let's say 150,000 Afghans, what are we going to do with hundreds of thousands of uh, migrants coming through from different countries? That yeah, makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And like you said, it's, again, it's the hot potato thing politically. Nobody wants to have it. They just keep going to the next group, to the next group, to the next group. Um, again, it's the human tragedy side of what's going on. I'm trying to think of what we as human beings or as a society can do to alleviate the problem. Um, villainizing the immigrants doesn't do anything. Uh, I sometimes wonder if it would be, if this would be grounds, uh, since people have been rattling their swords and saying, okay, this is a human invasion, if this is the preemptive talk for actually sending troops against the cartels, actually shutting them down because they've been doing this with such success, actually deploying military troops, fighter jets, to take them all out. Do well, you think that's a possibility? I think that's a huge undertaking, and I, I would, I would like to think that there'd be a way to slow them down, but at the same time, they control Mexico, and they control everything about Mexico, and so that's an undertaking that would basically take invading an entire country. They control the government, they control the enforcement, the police, the military, they control the smuggling laws, they control the border, and. That is no secret. And so to be able to take them out, it's going to be at all different levels throughout the government, throughout the country, um, throughout all the cities, the municipalities, the little villages. I just don't see where that's a practical way of, of doing the things. It's going to have to start here with some sort of consequence. But it's never going to stop. Immigration has been going on since the beginning of time, and it's going to go on to the end of time. I was just thinking, Blackjack Pershing, he, he went across the border, he actually invaded Mexico, people don't actually know that. Um, the Pancho Villa, who was obviously crossing the border and attacking villages and towns. And in fact, I think that was one of the reasons the Border Patrol was actually created, wasn't it? That's all part of the history. You know, you go back into the days when, when alcohol was illegal. That was in the, the very beginning days and U.S. Punch of and, and all those times, and, and things have evolved over time. You know, you had Ira, Ira, you had different things that came along through the earlier days, and then it's evolved into what it is now. And we are virtually without any immigration protection at this time, and we are catching release. I, I referenced last program, 
You know, President Obama came out and said we had a record number of apprehensions. Well, we did. But we also had a record number of releases. And so the same thing's going on now. When we catch somebody and they go into the ICE system, that immigration system, through the enforcement of removals, they're being released within about 72 hours. They're not being held to be deported. There's very few people, few people being removed. You need a body shop? You need engine repair? Auto Excellence. Collision Specialists. 631-261-6420. That's 631-261-6420. Auto Excellence. Elm Logistics. For all your logistic needs, call 631 631- 299-3595. That's 631-299-3595. Elm Global Logistics. Pride, performance, and partnerships. In the mood for a freshly roasted cup of coffee? www.offtherailscoffeeroasters.com Let me ask you this. This brings up the other issue. So you're involved in the resettlement of all these Afghanis in the country. How do you know who was a terrorist and who wasn't? And where their allegiance are? And we're talking to hardened, you know, fighters. I mean, you know, you look on YouTube and you see these, these things where they have a picture of a guy and says, you know, here he was and then with ISIS and here he is in Michigan, you know, running for mayor. Some of some other town or something. So as we talked about in the last program, it was uh, it was a tough deal. The ex- the evacuation of Afghanistan was not well planned out. Pretty much a disaster on all ends to try to help these folks out. A lot of these folks um, had been working for the State Department, working side by side with the military, interpreters, fighters. You name it, any number of, of things that they did for our country for over the last 18 years. And they were evacuated so quickly and haphazardly that they were in these new pads in Ramstein, Germany, in Italy, in Qatar, in the United Arab Emirates. And they ran a number of, of checks in these folks. Um, and then when they got into the safe havens, you know, I was at the deputy federal coordinator for one of the eight safe havens in the country in Dungeon here in Texas. There were additional checks run by CIS or Citizen Immigration Services and, and different entities, not just them, but different entities ran a whole bunch of checks to do our best, working along with FBI and different agencies around the world to intercept anyone who proposed a threat to the country. And I can tell you on our end, I can speak for the same thing that I worked at and worked with some of the operations for. I think we did an outstanding job taking our time and methodically go through to track these folks. If anybody of interest, there's of course reporting on the appropriate agency. So I feel fairly confident with the resources that we have and the agency we're working with that we did a decent job at it. Well, did you find, I, I, I wanted to jump in, did you find anyone of interest and what happened? I mean, do you have a personal story you can talk about without, you know, violating so, any kind of stuff? So I know a lot of that is, is pretty sensitive, um, but I'll say that if there was anybody that was found to have any tie whatsoever, whether it was through a phone number or social media or, or some name that checked against theirs, you know, similar to what we do with the terrorist watch list. Uh, a lot of support from a lot of the three-letter agencies around the country to fully investigate that and, and hang on to those folks until one, they were cleared or two, they were found to be in violation or, or a credible threat to the country. And what happened to the ones that weren't credible? Were they shipped back? So that wasn't really on our end. Uh, we leave that to the, the powers to be, uh, to handle. I mean, there are a lot of rules of shipping back people to communist countries or countries, you know, in the other sphere. So, but there's a lot of places in the world that, that we do have agreements with that these people can go to. Um, so um, I don't really know. I didn't concern myself too much with that end of it. You know, if there was anybody that was removed for any period of time, uh, we just tracked the end out. And our, our main focus was resettling as many people as possible. 
Well, okay, let's let's just do it hypothetically because we're dealing in maybe uh, contingency plans here. So let's say we continue. What is the contingency plan if you found? Let's say four or five guys that were actually in terror cell trying to sleep there. And would they go to jail? Would they? Would the agencies come and pick them up? Would they be returned to another country? I mean, typically, what what happens in a situation like that? So much like I said, we have there's different outfits that, that it's a collaborative effort, you know, through the FBI and some other agencies where. If we come across somebody that ha that hits off of a watch list, we'll turn them over to them. They'll do a full investigation, and then the number of outcomes, normally, like I said, is they will be returned to a country or their country that has been deemed a place to receive them. Um, but they're not going to be allowed to just be released. If they are in our country, obviously there's heavy monitoring because they re they realize that the threat level is low enough to have them in our country. But the monitoring level is extremely high. But again, there's, that's manpower intensive, that's resource intensive, so there may have to be a great deal, a high level of confidence for that to happen. It makes sense. I, I, I strongly, coming to an opinion, I guess, and maybe some other people are too, based on what we're hearing, with political hot potato going on, uh, and you have to wonder if it's not paid for but because no one is doing anything on a, on a political level and the people who are trying to are getting stonewalled at every, at every turn Senator Cruz is a good example um, and he, he just comes to mind I want to make a report not because he's a Republican or anything to anybody else but just because he's up in the media news making an issue of it um, and on a Democrat side, we've got some Supreme Court people also come forward trying to address the issue, including Obama himself at one time. I um, made that political thing we talked about, and I think he sincerely tried to do something. We just, we just couldn't figure out what that was, and it was hit un unexpectedly, like we said in 2019, with so many people come. So, um, my, my question to you is just. You know, um, what's next, you think, for the Border Patrol? How do they see their future? Because it, it's certainly changing from law enforcement to more of humanitarian aid. I mean, I mean like you said, there's a, a, a morale problem. Another thing I wanted to make our listeners aware of, we asked for uh, some kind of video and, and photographs from the, from the PR department. And it's not happening. It's not forthcoming. And that really, I find that very disturbing because we're trying to present a good opportunity for them to present their side of it. Uh, and the political powers are actually got them strapped. I'm seeing that. So how does it feel to be like kind of left out in the cold? And it, it, to me, I envision, I, I sort of like seeing you guys being the scapegoat, political scapegoat for well, what's going on with failed policies? And why would anybody want to join the Border Patrol with that going on? I mean, are you finding recruitment a real issue here? Yeah, so our, our numbers have been cut over the years. Um, we, they've come around significantly through funding and whatnot. And it's, it's not a defund the police by any means. It's not anything like that. The funding has been reduced. Um, recruitment is tough. There are plenty of people that want to do the job. Uh, the recruitment process is a hard process. The application is a tough process. But when you see the morale of the agents, you don't see the, the networking through the community, through their friends to try to recruit who they know. Um, when they're not out riding TVs, they're not out on horseback, they're not out on the line in a four-wheel drive truck, doing what they're hired to do, it, it makes it hard. The attacks by the media, the misrepresentation through the media, I know we touched on a little bit last time, but like the, this whole debacle over a horse patrol agent whipping somebody down to Del Rio, complete fallacy, complete fallacy. Everybody's been cleared of that, and you didn't hear the media come back and say, okay, we're sorry, we misrepresented anything. We misrepresented the fact that we said, and we showed a picture from a different angle of saying that a horse patrol 
uh, guy was whipping an illegal alien as he was in the legal mind wreck as they were coming across the border. That wasn't happening. And so the political attacks has now influenced a lot of the attitude. And that was one of the things that we preached to the guys and we muster. You go out, you do your job, you enforce, you go home safe, you keep the people in custody safe. You do everything the way you need to do it. We will back you up as long as you're within policy. But there's always that tendency to be apprehensive. Apprehensive, anything apprehensive creates a, an officer safety concern. So we have to keep the apprehensiveness out of when the attacks affecting our agents because anytime they're apprehensive, they're going to get hurt. And so that's a huge concern. And so, yes, recruitment's tough. Um, we are losing agents to other agencies because they're not going to have to deal with what they're doing up here. You know, for example, maybe they just go process people for removal to work the enforcement removal, removal operations. Maybe they go and investigate some of cases of narcotics in the HSI, hit homeland security investigations. We're losing people all over the place in different agencies. And it's happening. You're losing really good people, people that really is, are needed because of this is a job you just walk into. I mean, it takes experience. You need experienced people to teach the new recruits coming up. And if you don't have enough experienced uh, agents, uh, the whole thing starts to unwind. And the people who really get hurt are the people who need it the most. And that's the people who are, like you said, being served humanitarian. Humanitarian. I, I remember a... Uh, very interesting movie once. It was, it was the first time I actually saw a Border Patrol trade in a certain way where an agent actually went across the border to rescue a baby. Um, I thought that was rather rather uh, inspiring. And I later found out that it was a tr based on an actual event that this agent was so moved by what he saw happen that he actually reunited the mother with the child. Um, and put his whole career on the line in his life for that matter. And it's never been really played up in the news. It's just one of those stories that I was kind of allowed to hear being in certain circles. And it's it's just a shame to me that Hollywood hasn't really taken a look at what's going on there at the border and really put a shine a light on it in a way that it really is going on. Because I really believe that that is the purpose of media. And especially entertainment media, is to make things better. Television, if you will. You know, that's exactly what it means. Tell a vision. Show people what's happening so that they can make their own decisions. The media should be, instead of commentating on all this, in my opinion, just doing what I'm doing here. Letting you guys talk. Letting people hear what's going on and make your own opinion of what needs to be done. Well, as we said, we were talking here, there's two sides to this. And Title 32, yes, you're putting people on that side of the border, but what happens to them there? And are they better off being in the cages? That becomes a, a, a you know, a, the catch-22, if you will, in this whole scenario. You know, for any politician, um, any person who's, I believe, has to make some kind of policy decision. I certainly do need to protecting the agents. I think we need to be encouraging and getting them out. Um, there are many rules to this kind of job, and they're not always physical. They're deep, deep emotional scars. And when they're vilified, you know, that only adds to the problem. And they're dealing with some very brave human beings and who really care about the country and are really patriots. Um, and care about other human beings. That way. You don't want to see them exploit. And that's what the Border Patrol does. So I think a lot of people are confused, Clay, and I, when the media portrays it, everybody thinks that the, you can't separate the Border Patrol from being an enforcement arm, an actual law enforcement agency, from an like immigration agency or a customs agency, if you will. And maybe you, you could help us kind of define the differences between all the different agencies and make this clear so people understand what the rules are in these different agencies play uh, in this process. Sure, so some of the, some of the big ones, uh, and first, just to make a point on um, something in the big picture of operationalized welcome to some of the people that we had out there helping us with these Afghans. But um, the point I wanted to make is 
the same people that came down and, and vilified us and criticized us also came back, some did, came back and never offered a solution, but at least stopped the criticism once they realized what's really going on on the border. For example, I grew up in the Midwest. Before I joined the Border Patrol, I didn't know what the border looked like, I didn't know what happened. And so I came in as a young man straight out of college and had no idea what was going on. So I used to tell all the politicians that have come down, both sides of the border, you guys have the power to make a change here. And you guys have come down and got your boots dirty on the border. You've listened to what's going on from our end, from the tactical side of the operation. You now have that insight to be able to go back and in some sort of media, some sort of hearing, have some input and say, I was there. And I used to tell them, I don't care what side you come from, I don't care what your opinion is. Give the opinion that you had down here when you were with us. And that will that will change things. And so I wanted to make that point, and, and and just so that's why nothing is changing. People don't know what happened. Do you think it, go ahead. I was going to say, I was going to say, do you think it, it, it would take some kind of international body to intervene to, to come in, like the UN or something, and handle the situation and take the pressure off of you and New Mexico? Do you think that's an option? You know, never, never explored that option, never even heard that option put on the table. I'm not sure what they would do differently than me. Um, there's got to be enforcement. The U.S. is not going to be an enforcement side. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of collaboration with a great uh, group. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm going to stop here. I was thinking not in terms of enforcement, but I was thinking more in terms of, like, humanitarian aid. I was thinking, like, you know, you have the U.N. come in and they would help you settle all these immigrants um, in Guatemala, let's say in Finland. I mean, I'm just using that as an example off the top of my head, but something like that, or China, different parts of the world. Uh, certainly in countries that are, you know, they actually have a population crisis. Uh, there are certain countries that actually the you know, population is doing really so badly that they, you know, they, they we don't know what they're, what's going to happen to the elders in that society. Who's going to take care of Because the people above, you know, above 50, you know, are greater than 30. You know, the, the age group's 30 and below. And we're talking stream, stream uh, demographics here. So you're going to have a society of a lot of old people are going to need care and need some kind of a working structure to pay for their care and well-being. I was just thinking, maybe that's the solution. Find out what those countries are and, and just kind of resettle people that way based on the needs of the, of the world. What are your thoughts on that? First time I heard it, and definitely outside of the box thinking, and uh, definitely something if countries are willing to accept and the people are willing to go, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> it's like, uh, that's, that's as far out of the box as I've heard. <laughs> we're, we're pretty... Pretty square and red lighters on when we think about things. Well, I, I can see that. I mean, you're everywhere things going. But I'm really thinking here, and I get my head going. That's kind of like how I see it. I'm thinking maybe that's the solution here. You know, you have people who want a better life, and there's more places in the world than just the United States that that can offer that to them. Um, and maybe that's the way it has to work. You know, hey, it's like, you know, if I can interrupt you, I, a thought on that, that right there. So you say that that's a solution. So that would be part of the solution. There is no one turnkey option for this. We've got to have enforcement. We've got to have housing. We've got to have resettlement. We've got to have assistance. We've got to have a UN option to send people to different countries if that's out there. And, you know, when you talk about parts of the solution, the wall is part of the solution. It's not a wall, it's a big fence, but it's part of a solution for our immigration problem. So there's so many little parts that everything outside of the box of what we're doing, so what we're doing right now is not going to work. So anything outside of the box is going to be part of that, that big plan or that, that big corporate solution that's going to make this go away. So I'm glad you brought up the wall because we discussed it briefly in the previous episode. Um, and I, I like the fact that you're saying how what, what existed before, what exists now, 
uh, how it can be better. Um, my thinking of the role of those, uh, the devil, uh, being a devil's advocate, the argument can be made, well, the wall of wall can keep people out, it also can keep people in. You know, people won't be able to leave the United States. That's a big fear amongst a lot of uh, people. You know, it's a legitimate concern that the world, with the wall going up, they're, they're feeling imprisoned by it. That they, there's no way to some major catastrophe happen. There would be, there'd be no way to get away, if you would. Look at this turn into a Nazi Germany. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So my thoughts on that are first, calling it the wall, I think, is more of a political term than it is anything else. It's not a wall. When I think of a wall, I know a lot of the guys that I work with, you think of the Berlin Wall. What's the purpose of Berlin, the Berlin Wall? Like you said, keep people in or out, right? Or both. When you think of the Great Wall of China, why it was built. It was built to keep people out or in. And we built for a reason. This, this is not a wall. In fact, if you talk to people in Mexico coming across, they actually call it a fence. I mean, there's a word we use. It's, you know, it's just like poles, basically. It's just like the bars on the windows of a, of a prison. And, and if you look at the actual structure of the wall, it's metal. And it, it goes up, and there's slats in it. And, and so there's only sections. It's not a great wall that stretches across the border. And so really, I think it's no more than an excellent tool that's improved officer safety. It's given us some technology. It's enabled us to funnel people so they're safer when they do come across because we know they're going to come. And it's safer for our agents because they can operate and have access points to go to. So uh, I see the wall, that term, as a political uh, name for the structure for people that opposed it. It is nothing more than a, a really, really nice exaggeration of the fence that was there before it. That's interesting. It's very interesting. But it's sort of like the media played with it, sessions played with that imagery. And it's, it, I, I want to be out there to think about this. When we talk about a wall, it's not really a wall. It's like you said, it's that. It's a fence. And uh, when we say uh, fences make for good neighbors, that, uh, maybe that's the thinking here. Um, and that's how we should bring it in a context so we can better understand it. Is there any demographics that you can share with us regarding who are the most primary? I would say cartel members that. Are, that or threats to the border patrol. So, the cartels, as I said, are a business model. And the threat is not so much the cartel against the border patrol. Right. I'm saying it's, I'm saying it's young, young guys trying to make a name for themselves, or the channels these, the border patrol, uh, maybe commit violence against them. I mean, I'm sure we're seeing that. So, my take on the cartel, you know, I've worked, you know, in Canada, and I've worked with different, different operational groups, different places, I've been in many different stations, and it's not really the cartels that pose a threat to us. It's a business model for these folks, and they know if they go up and, and take some pot shots at the Border Patrol, which, it happens. But they know if they start killing Border Patrol agents, if they start threatening Border Patrol agents, the resources are going to collapse, and it's going to change their business model. It's going to make it a little harder. It's going to change that calculated loss and gain, or that little game of, game of cat and mouse. Mm -hmm. It's going to change that for them. And so the threat comes because of the business model. The threat comes from the people coming across that we don't know about. The threat comes when there's desperation, whenever something goes into place where we can actually stop something or deter, detract, diminish something, it ups, it, it, it increases that level of desperation. When the level of desperation increases, and people are starting, there's a consequence of something, and people start running, people start fighting, people start doing things differently, because they know it's not a free pass for an open moment. Right, so the, the idea is, 
how Hollywood kind of portrays these cartels from across the borders. Uh, would you say over romanticized? I, I'd say incredibly over romanticized. And, you know, people watch movies, say, Sicario or one of these movies like that. That stuff doesn't happen. That not, it's not part of the border patrol life. And, yes, is there a threat along the border? Of course. Is there border violence? Of course there is. It's always going to be there. But cartels are not dumb. They're not going to do something that's going to impact the world negatively. And so the game is played. They're far smarter than they are. Their counterintelligence is excellent. That's all they have time to do. Well, we're worrying about humanitarian. We're worrying about staffing. We're worrying about all these other things, drugs, people. We're worrying about a lot of things. And so we need a violence cartel on border control violence. Is there? But it's minimal. Is it a concern? Absolutely. The care and concern for our agents to get, get the job done and go home safely every day is the primary mission for us. And so is a concern, of course. But they're highly trained. They're, they're smart guys and guys that go out there and work. And so the cartel violence is not at that top level of concern, at least in my book. Right. It's, it's important to know because I, mean, I think that's kind of the way it's been portrayed to most Americans and and. Uh, the real threat here, I think, is how. what do we do with these children? What do we do to protect them from being, from being used in traffic? In, in my mind, the greatest threat right now that we're seeing as far as the border goes is traffic. I could be wrong. I mean, am I wrong? Am I correct? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? You know, as we discussed in the last episode, the dangers of these people traveling through several countries, through the entire country of Mexico, there is a lot of uh, abuse, of, of rape, of robbery, extortion, and, and, and people are in danger. They're put in peril to come to the country. We are that magnet, like we discussed. And then a lot of times, when they get here, they're still indebted. They're still in that indebted servitude, so when they go to work, they still owe their threats against their families, and they know that if they don't do certain things, things can happen to their families elsewhere. And so that, that threat is real, and that is the true violence, and, and that is the peril that we put these folks in by drawing them in, by not having that consequence, by having an open border where people just come and come and come and come, and the cartel is just going to charge and charge and charge and charge to make their money go their way through their business model, which only empowers them and makes them stronger to rule even more and to control even further. And so by us doing that, we are empowering these cartels. We are empowering these nefarious organizations that are extorting, beating, charging, transporting, whatever, people to the border, and then even for the border of the country. Well, what are your thoughts on the allegations being leveled by some groups saying that the border will never get better because um, both political parties are controlled in this country by the cartels now? Well, I would never accuse falsely or without evidence of any level of corruption going on, but I'm sure there's stuff that goes on everywhere. And why the border is not the way it is, why we're not allowed to enforce, why things are the way they are, um, is unknown. Uh, I don't I don't know more than I speculate on that. Um, it, it's odd, you know, that things happen the way they are, but I think I told you in the last episode, the border control is like bumper bowling. You set up the bumpers, we bounce in between, whichever the rules are. We just can't throw a gun ball because we're dealing with human lives. So, uh, level of corruption, I think corruption is everywhere in the world. That's just an opinion, uh, but I don't have any evidence of it. But there's obviously something going on that, that we're not allowed to do what we need to do. Right. Well, I think that's an important thing because a lot of people, I think, see conspiracy in a lot of things in the world. And it's just little. I think a, a lot of the times people are looking for full approval and change doesn't happen unless they, unless they see the masses moving in a certain direction or opinion moving in a certain direction and then it, and then it happens. Um, I mean, that's just part of being a political animal uh, in politics in general. And you just look at the history of the world. Uh, but uh, I want to thank you, Clayton, 
uh, for being on the show. Is, is there anything you'd like to talk about before we wrap this up uh, regarding any topics you, you would like to discuss or things you'd like to bring up? I just hope that this message, other messages coming across, paint the picture truthfully for the country so that people make their own decision. Uh, I think we all believe in immigration. The country is founded on immigration. There's a legal way of doing it, and there's an illegal way of doing it. And any time it's for a political position or a picture or some kind of an agenda, it's going to be wrong. Uh, if you consider the people that are coming and where they're coming from and why they're coming here, uh, that should be the main focus. Um, to create a, a legal path to residency, citizenship, or however you want to put it. It's got to be reasonable and it's got to be practical. And the numbers have to make sense. And that also comes with consequence. If, people, if there is a true path to immigration and it's not followed, there has to be a consequence. And there has to be the resource to enforce that consequence, whatever that might be. Obviously, my opinions are, are fairly stringent based on my 25 plus years that I did it. But um, I think with every good rule, there has to be a consequence for breaking the rule as well. I agree. Accountability is key to having a civilized society. Um, it's like the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. You know, everybody has to do their part. Not just shriek it off of the next person. Thank you very much, Clayton, for joining us. Um, everyone, I can't stress enough, listen to this episode over and over again. I'm sure you're going to find something new in it. I know I have. Uh, listening to the last ten things I thought I heard, I'm most. So, again, uh, I'd love to hear your opinions. I'd love to hear your opinion on my thought there as far as, like, maybe some kind of humanitarian aid being set up at the border where we have relocation, not just in the United States, but in the places of the world that really could benefit from a larger population. So um, thank you again, Clayton, and uh, and I hope we, um, uh, we'll talk soon and we'll revisit this again if there's any big changes in the border. Thank you for being our guest, and I especially thank you for, for doing a, a job well done. And I know that uh, I want to thank you personally for that as well and keeping the border safe. I know you made a lot of personal sacrifices yourself, and, you know, with your family and friends to make a, a safe and, and, and to keep you all at that. Thank you again. All right. Thanks, Frank. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. All right, folks. When the world's barred, do you have any comments, please? Feel free to share them. Uh, I will be taking in phone calls shortly, uh, and I'll let you keep you informed on that. So um, I think there's a lot to discuss here, especially after hearing this valuable information. I'd love to hear from you, your thoughts, your opinions, and where you think we need to go with this problem. Thank you.